Welcome to our March 3rd Douglas County Board of Director Commissioners business meeting. We want to welcome any of you who are at the Douglas County Courthouse or joining us online. I just want to pass on a bit of information regarding how we'll run our meetings on Zoom during this time of social distancing. If visual aids are used during the meeting, the presenter will share their screen with the call. Participants will not be able to view them without a computer, smartphone, or tablet. All participants will be entered into the meeting with their audio muted, meaning the commission and the public will not be able to hear you. Presenters will be unmuted when their agenda item comes up. We ask that all online presenters use good conference call etiquette and mute their line when not speaking and introduce themselves each time they speak. If you have a public comment on an agenda item or under regular public comment, please use the raise your hand function on Zoom. Staff will call on you and unmute you. We ask that speakers give their name and address for the minutes. The county reserves the right to shut off the microphone and remove any speaker from the meeting if they are vulgar, rude, or inappropriate. The chat function has been disabled and a recording of this meeting will be available on our website after the meeting. We will start with the consent agenda. Would either of the other commissioners like to pull anything from our consent agenda? No. No. Vera, do we have anyone with you there in person who might uh, want to pull anything? No, we don't have anyone for consent. Jill, is there anyone online for consent? No. Okay, then we will move forward with a vote on the consent agenda. All of those in favor of approving it, please say aye. 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 Thank you. So we will move to our, oh, we'll move to General public comment. Sarah, has anyone joined you in the past 15 seconds? No, I don't have anyone here at the courthouse for public comment. Jill, has anyone raised their hand wishing to make public comment online? No. Okay, thank you both. We will now move on to our regular agenda. We'll start with item 3.1, adopt pay ranges and pay policy for countywide elected officials. Sarah, do we have a presentation on this item? Uh, no, we don't have a formal presentation, Commissioners. What's in your packet um, uh, describes the item. Michelle Spear with our Human Resources Department is here as well, and I will move her over in case you have questions for her in this process. But I, I wanted to kick it off and really um, just mention that, you know, this was really something that uh, came about last year. Um, and um, oh, uh, and uh, about um, uh, related to pay for countywide elected officials. We did not have um, we did not have them in pay ranges and that's pretty traditional um, for um, to not have elected officials in pay ranges. but what makes it difficult is then when people file on their filing fee, um, it, it was hard to, to begin to figure out what that filing fee should be. And so really this is a best practice that, you know, if, if somebody turns over in that position, they, the new incumbent would start at the lower part of that range. We work closely to make sure that those ranges are consistent with what we believe the pay should be for those positions. I've spoken personally multiple times to each uh, countywide elected official on this process, and they're all in support of what we have in front of you today. Related to ongoing compensation increases, um, you know, really that has been our past practice and our, and is, is stated in policy and um, stated in policy and in our budget every year. I do want to clarify, because I think we had some questions. Um, uh, elected officials receive the average of all compensation increases that employees receive. That's, that's built into our budget process. It's approved as a part of your budget and it's built into our personnel policies. So I really just uh, stand for any questions the commissioners might have on this item. Thank you, Sarah. This is Commissioner Portillo. As commissioners are thinking through questions, um, Commissioner Kelly pointed out that we did not actually have a motion or a second on the consent agenda. I'm sorry, I was moving through that too quickly. Um, so maybe please go back to that and have a motion in a second and we will retake that vote. I will move to approve today's consent agenda for March 3rd. And I'll go ahead and second. Thank you both. And we will now go ahead and vote on approving the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, Commissioner Reed, I did notice that you were unmuted. I don't know if you want to kick us off with questions. 
Uh, I didn't have any questions. I, I think I unmuted myself when I saw Commissioner Kelly's um, comment and uh, just didn't unmute myself. So I don't think I have any questions about this item though. I don't know that I have any questions, Sarah. I appreciate all the work to talk to the different electives. I know that, um, you know, we did have some conversations about this prior to the election. And, and I think this had just been sort of a past practice. So I, I, you know, we just pick up where people left off. And I think we had some people who had been in those positions for a long time. And so, um, I just appreciate the thoughtfulness on this, Sarah, and thinking ahead for future years and and um, and what we do when we have those times when people are in positions for long periods of time, how we how that impacts not only our budget, but we want to appropriately compensate people for the experience that they have. So thanks for all your work on that. This is Commissioner Bertio. I echo everything that Commissioner Kelly mentioned. This does seem like something that we needed to have updated and now we have and I appreciate all of the pre-work that you put into it, Sarah. Um, it does look like we do need to take action on this item. And so I'm looking for a motion to approve. I'll we go ahead. Take uh, public comment. <laughs> yes, thank you. Do we have anyone in the courthouse for public comment? We do not. Jill, is there anyone online who'd like to participate in public comment? No. Thank you. Before I make a motion on this, I will say, Commissioner Portillo, this is where it's really nice for us to be there in person and we can sort of mention on the side, hey, don't forget. So yeah, no worries on this, it's, that just happens. But I'll, uh, if it's okay with the commission, I'll go ahead and make a motion to consider approving elected official pay as stated in attachment A, effective with all newly elected or newly sworn officials elected after this date. I will second that motion. And I'll bring it for a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. And we will move on to 3.2. Um, county match for moderate income housing grant. And Sarah, do we have a presentation on this? Um, I think Jill wants to say a few words about the project. So I'll turn it over to Jill. Commissioners, um, thanks for letting me update you real quickly on this and um, have you consider um, what ordinarily would be something that could be approved administratively. And it was discussed with the previous commission uh, last year. Um, um, in order to um, put together their resolution to apply for this grant, um, as I detailed in the background. Um, but I did wanna, you know, as the, at the, as the background uh, uh, memo lets you know, we were awarded the grant, the full amount of $400,000. So evenly split between the city of Baldwin and the city of Eudora. Um, and there's just a, a lot of excitement for this grant and the matching funds that will come from the county. Um, again, evenly split 10,000 for each community um, will be put to work um, immediately. Um, the, um, on February 1st, um, tenants to homeowners closed on the lots in Baldwin and um, uh, let's see, uh, uh, Habitat for Humanity is moving forward with um, their site planning and their floor plans um, for their projects as well. Um, so again, these funds um, that will come from the county for the matches, and then we'll be able to start drawing down 15% of the committed grant dollars from um, KHRC um, to start moving these projects forward. Um, and hopefully there'll be some significant progress that we can share with you all later this year. Um, and one of the things that this is just, is just one example of what um, I'm hopeful can be a pattern of partnerships with um, our, our um, partners in Baldwin, Eudora, and at some point possibly um, LeCompton to advance some opportunities to look at what's the county's role in affordable housing. Um, I think, you know, the conversation that we had with, uh, that the judges had um, when on the luncheon that you all had last week about the need for affordable housing and accessible housing, um, we don't do a lot um, in this area, but this was one opportunity that the county could apply on um, 
behalf of two, two of our community partner agencies and two of the cities. And um, this has really been an, a really great opportunity for our two city partners to see how amazing um, the um, collaborative work um, of the of tenants to homeowners through the land trust and Habitat for Humanity can be in providing some significant investments in their, uh, in their communities. Um, I'll just say Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Buford from Tenants to Homeowners was um, reflecting on going out and seeing the, the lots that they closed on in Baldwin and getting so excited because usually the projects that, they're, that Tenants to Homeowners is building on are in the city of Lawrence. They're much smaller lots and they look a lot different. The lots that they were able to acquire through this project um, and a big shout out to um, Dave Hill with Mid-America Bank who um, was a partner in this project as well. Um, they're really beautiful lots. They're close to a nature trail and it's really gonna be um, a great project for the city of Baldwin um, and the project in Eudora as well. Um, so I just wanna highlight the work we've been doing so far and um, stand for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Jill. We'll open it up for questions. So I've got a couple of questions on this one. Uh, my first question is, have we had any discussions with the city of Baldwin or the city of Eudora about their um, desire? I'm sure they're excited about it and that's awesome. But um, I also know that other municipalities have put significant energy into affordable housing. Um, have we had any conversations with Baldwin or Eudora about the energy they're planning on putting into it? For this project, there are gonna, there's gonna be some, um, some permitting, um, some um, collaborative work there, but in terms of what to expect in the future, no. Um, my hope um, is that um, I've included um, the folks that are, worked on, are working on this project um, in the, um, the new, renewed efforts around the um, community health plans housing plank um, to try to make sure that we're bringing in the partners from the potential partners from Baldwin and Eudora so that we, as we revisit that plan, I say the royal we, um, I mean, we're gonna talk about that plan here after, the, after this agenda item, we're truly challenging all of our community, all of our county partners on what their role is going to be. Um, so that's all I can say at this point is that we've just, I'm, I'm trying to be very intentional about including Baldwin and Eudora in these future planning conversations. Commissioner Reed here. Um, I appreciate that, Jill, and I think that, um, I mean, I'm excited to read about this and think it's a really good opportunity to jumpstart some conversations about sustainability of these efforts and how to um, grow that. And I'm really grateful to Tenants to Homeowners and Habitat for Humanity for really expanding their reach beyond Lawrence and um, which this may very well not be the very first time that either of them have done that but as somebody who um, works and has worked in social services in this community sometimes there's a lot of things that feel siloed to Lawrence at times or only accessible to Lawrence residents um, so I'm always happy to see um, agencies that are really expanding their reach and looking at the whole of Douglas County. And so I'm glad that we as a county organization are, and government are pay, playing a role in helping support that um, kind of jumpstart and facilitating some of the relationship building that goes along with that. So thanks for your work in that. This is Commissioner Portillo. If we don't have additional questions from commissioners, we'll open it up to public comment. Sarah, do we have anyone in the courthouse? No, we don't. Jill, I feel bad for asking you to pull double duty here, but do we have anyone online raising their hand? I'm not seeing anyone. Do we have any additional conversation from commissioners? I do just want to say, I echo what Commissioner Reed said. I really appreciate that countywide focus on this project in 
seeing the county move forward with this. Yeah, I won't disagree that I'm excited about, you know, affordable housing and really, um, you know, we've done a lot of work with tenants to homeowners and, and more so recently with Habitat for, for Humanity and the work that we do there. And I know that they are very involved with the affordable housing advisory board at the city level. Um, I just want to make sure we have a couple of things that we sort of do just for Eudora and just for Baldwin. And I think that's understandable. And, and, and that we certainly want to support good projects, but we also want to make sure that we are providing for, for affordable housing countywide, not just for certain municipalities. Um, and, and so to that end, yes, I'm waiting. Go ahead, Sarah. It looks like you took a big breath. You were going to say something. Yes, because I, I, uh, I guess I feel like I, I want to step in here that, you know, this was a really, like you said, this is a really great project. It was a really nice opportunity to link up these organizations with these communities with state resources. However, when it comes to affordable housing, really the county has seen its role as more involved in supportive housing, which is a little slightly different take than affordable housing and workforce housing. So I, I think, um, you know, obviously we will do what the commission wants us to do in terms of our support in this area. And we stand ready to partner with our with all of our partners in the in the community in the cities to help advance things that we know are important. However, you know, it's I, I'm also trying to make sure we have a you know what lane we're staying in. And until we decide we want to put our signal on and change lanes. And uh, so I just affordable housing made me want to come off the mic in terms of that changing lanes. I really feel like this was a one time great pilot project to get things started. And I'm, we're all super excited about it. So I don't want my weird bureaucratic worry about structure to, to get in that way. I would yeah. actually argue that's not a bureaucratic worry, that's a policy worry, but that's a Agreed. separate wonky debate that we can have. Um, but I do really appreciate your focus on what is our role as a county? We tend to focus on supportive housing and supportive housing is much more in that behavioral and mental health care space that is something we have taken on. This is a one-time piece. I am happy that we have the opportunity to participate in this one-time funding space. Yes, and I, I realize that this was a unique opportunity and sometimes these grants come up and, and if it, I hope it spurs on bigger conversations. That was my question to Jill is, are those conversations happening? Because I, I, um, I want this to be a one-time opportunity. I guess that's what we say one-time opportunity. And I, I want to make sure that we are consistent with where our priorities have been in, in this work. Well, I do think that it's important to kind of recognize when we can leverage dollars in grant opportunities like this, that if the county has the ability to make sure that our partners in municipalities can go after those bigger dollars that we make that happen when we can. And I think that may be where we walk that really fine line of what are our policy goals and how do we support communities going after these larger grant dollars? Because I think that that is something where that's bringing money into our communities that didn't originate with the city, didn't originate with the county and the county can help create those opportunities then we can play a role in that. Yeah, and absolutely. It may not be completely consistent with our lane all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think it's that, but you know, as, as, as commissioners have seen from the agenda report, the match here is pretty small. So I do think this is something that future, that city of Baldwin or city of Eudora could take on in the future. You know, it doesn't require a separate sales tax. It doesn't require investments um, of another way to, to take advantage of these opportunities. And, and now once they've been through the motions one time, you know, and obviously we're here to assist, we're here to help navigate, we're here to, you know, hold hand is the word of the day. Um, you know, we're here to help with that process. I just think that it's one of those things that um, if we talk more about affordable housing, we need to have a larger policy conversation about how that works. And, and I will, I'll add, um, Commissioner Portillo, um, that one thing that I probably should have put in this memo is 
the moderate income housing grant is only for communities um, that are with populations of 60,000 or less. So that was a question I had of the of KHRC when I first learned about this grant program, which was, um, can the county, if you peel out, if you peel out the city of Lawrence, can the county apply? And the answer was yes. So it is a unique opportunity, but there's no reason why match dollars cannot be coming from our partners in Baldwin and Eudora. Um, and I do think that, you know, just their, their eyes are open to the power of the land trust um, and the role that tenants to homeowners play in that permit, making them permanently affordable for the community. Um, it's, and so there's, I think it is, it's part of a larger strategy and policy considerations. And I'm, I'm really optimistic that we can have that, those conversations as part of um, the chip. I appreciate all of the conversation here. And if we do not have additional discussion, I move to approve a one-time county match grant of $20,000 from FY 2021 general fund reserves. Did we take public comment? I don't think we took public. That's what I was just gonna ask. No, I think no, we, we started. Did, we did, we, did. we no, took we did. public comment um, after questions from commissioners. We did public comment, then we had discussion of commissioners. It does look like we have a raised hand though. I don't know if you all want to back up to. Happy to back up if we have a raised hand. All right. Let's see. Mary, um, I see that you have your, raise, your hand raised. So it's open for public comment for you if you'd like to unmute. Sorry, I'm not sure what that was. All right. <laughs> I believe I've actually seen that stock footage in other um, <laughs> Zoom crashes, so. All right, well, lesson learned. It's always good to check. Yep. I appreciate checking. Sarah, do we have anyone in the courthouse? We do not, thank you. So I will go ahead and Move that we approve a one-time county match grant of twenty thousand dollars from FY twenty twenty one general fund reserves. I will second that motion. All of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Fantastic. We will move on to item three point three, community health plan update and presentation of the anti-poverty plan. And I believe we do have a presentation on this. Uh, commissioners, um, I'm going to uh, hand things off to Valerie Carson with uh, the Douglas County Health Department, and she's going to tee things off with a, an overview of the community health plan process and the community health assessment, and I'm going to do a share screen and pull up a PowerPoint that um, I'm going to pop through for her. Um, good evening. Can you hear me? Great. Um, I apologize and I hope that um, the sound is not too strange as I am out at the Douglas County Fairgrounds today after our vaccination clinic and um, so I am hiding in the concession stand area and once in a while things get kind of loud in here but we'll do the best we can. If you need me to repeat something please let me know. Um, thank you for this opportunity to come and provide a brief overview and update on um, the Douglas County um, Community Health Assessment and um, Improvement Plan. My name is Valerie Carson and I'm the Director of Policy and Planning at Lawrence Douglas County Public Health. And in that role, I act as principal staff for Douglas County's Community Health Plan. And I'm here this evening really to kind of provide an overview and um, on and an update on that assessment and planning process and that hopefully that can be a foundation from which then Leah will be able to speak more about one of the focus areas of that particular improvement plan, which is anti-poverty. Next slide. So 
So Lawrence Douglas County Public Health is committed to partnering with others in this community to identify and assess the priority health issues and factors impacting its residents' health. Many, if not most, arguably, um, of those factors that drive the root causes of our chronic disease issues and inequities in health are often created, obviously, outside of the public health system um, and can be maintained outside. And that really requires that that means that if we are going to make a difference in the population's health, we need to move outside of our building and partner with those in our community. Um, many of those types of factors, things are all things that you've talked about already this evening. So do people have adequate and affordable housing that, that they can access? Do they, can they access healthy foods or physical activity opportunities? Do they have good educational options? Um, do they have opportunities for employment and, and to make an income that they can meet their household's basic needs? All of those kinds of things are very, very important for their overall health. And we need to address those kinds of things if we are going to bring about the vision of a community in which we all have a just opportunity for full health and well-being. Um, as you notice here, part of that assessment and improvement process is part of being an accredited health department. And we are right now in the 2018 2023 um, improvement plan. Next. So just as a pretty picture, much prettier <laughs> than some of my other ones, why do we do this health assessment? We do that assessing in order to be able to really understand both qualitative and quantitative data on the current health status of local residents and what their needs and issues are. It also becomes really important in doing that assessment that not only are we saying these are the issues, but from the community and from our partners, what are the most important things that need to be addressed to make a long-term and sustainable type of difference? So when we, um, once we have that assessment, that becomes a foundation on which we create a plan, a health improvement plan, and it's why we call the CHIP, the CHIP, because it's the Community Health Improvement Plan, um, which we put together those goals and strategies and partnerships, et cetera, that gets us to that community in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. So next slide. Where we are right now is back in, in our current cycle. Back in, I think probably late 2016, 2017, there began to be the collection and analysis of local community data. A lot of focus groups and um, community members came together to talk about what was important and then to decide on what was important to act on. Um, with phase two, we had that community health strategic planning process. And while, our most recent community health improvement plan is technically 2018 to 2023. Um, I think as will become evident tonight, in many ways, that's a living document because that will change as conditions in the community change and as different things are taken on. And so while that was originally put out in 2018, as we're gonna be talking to later on tonight, Leo will be talking about the anti-poverty component of it, which was actually the plan that component of the plan was just approved this past January. And so once that planning gets into place, we begin to take action. And when I say we, as I think Jill said, the royal we is your partners that are identified as critical to being able to move some of those particular um, objectives forward that are identified as priority. Um, and at the same time, we need to continually be evaluating um, what the impact of those actions are and the achievement of those objectives, because we can put a lovely plan in place and do a whole lot of accomplishments, but if they're not changing the baseline data from which we're trying to address, then we really haven't accomplished much. Next. So your biggest community health assessment kind of pieces are convening partners, understanding and framing those issues and the fact and the factors that contribute to them, developing goals and objectives for those issues, identifying and prioritizing the strategies, and then creating action steps with identified partners. 
And this is kind of the, the nuts and bolts. So go ahead. As you see here, um, part of that process the last time around really identified and I have all nine of the different priority pieces that were identified initially with access to healthcare, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, mental health, et cetera. And what, what emerged over time um, is that we had four different primary areas that were going to be addressed. That of behavioral health, having um, collapsed alcohol, tobacco, other drugs, and mental health issues within that. Um, healthy food and physical activity, um, housing, and what was then called poverty and jobs and is now called the anti-poverty focus area. Um, but across all four of these, there was a, an intentional lens on addressing inequities in health. Next. And so if you look at the focus areas um, and there's been different types of graphics, I think some of these probably sound very familiar since we were just talking about safe and affordable housing this evening. So that being one of the focus areas, um, the convener is the Lawrence Douglas County Housing Authority. Anti-poverty is being convened by United Way and Douglas County um, and in conjunction with a lot of their human services coalition. Behavioral health convener is Douglas County with um, Bob Triansky's Behavioral Health Leadership Coalition pulling that together. And then access to healthy foods and healthy built environment, which is a convener for Live Well Douglas County. What becomes important for all of these is, as you can see, housing, poverty, behavioral health, access to healthy foods, those are not things that can happen within the health department's building. These are things that have to happen outside of the health department, but in conjunction with um, different partners that can move these things, things that, that bring different resources, different bridges, different types of partnerships, and, um, and who can identify what is most likely to be successful in the community and what will bring the objectives that are identified as priority forward. In the very um, recent, this past year, and once when, there, when Lawrence Douglas County Public Health declared racism as a public health issue, crisis, excuse me, um, that helped that lens through which we looked at all of these different components about inequities was more formalized into an additional focus area, which is now called health equity and justice. Next. And as I said before, it's really important throughout all of this for us to have ongoing evaluation. And the primary way that we know whether we're making progress on the community health improvement plan is by looking at what types of changes are going on in the community related to policy and systems and the environment that move us closer to being able to accomplish those objectives. And so we're looking at baselines, we're trying to get to new baselines that we feel like would reflect improvement for those issues. And um, we're also in a thoughtful way, um, realizing that maybe some of the objectives that were set by some of the groups um, might get accomplished and yet our overall goals are still not being accomplished. And so what else needs to be done? Next. Um, I think, and I wanted to highlight this because I think the anti-poverty plan, which you're gonna learn more about, is one of those really, really strong examples of how you can bring multiple sectors together and have representation across those sectors in order to address a very complex issue. And so as you see here, you have advocacy organizations and community members with lived experience, the Chamber of Commerce, et cetera. All of those different sectors being at the table at the same time um, are key to be able to one, develop the types of actions that would be most appropriate to be able to um, get your objectives completed but also brings, you know, it, my experience with bringing together a lot of different sectors is that you often then develop partnerships, relationships, and trust among those different sectors so that in future times that you have another opportunity to work on shared goals together. Next. 
So in wrapping that up really quickly, I just wanna let you know what's kind of ongoing and what's next. Um, we, with that addition of the health equity and justice focus area, um, right now, in reality, it's really still being under, it's under development and, and being defined and it will continue to be defined as we start to bring people to the table around that. There is that ongoing implementation and refinement of the existing plan, um, given that it is in many ways a living document. And as Leo will share with us, that um, the action plan around anti-poverty was really just very recently agreed upon, but they're moving quick already. And, um, and honestly, since we are in the 2018, 2023, it's already time for us to start to be talking about doing the next community health assessment that will inform the 2024, 2029 chip. And those things will be happening in parallel where we'll still be working on the 2018, 2023 one while we are already preparing for what happens the next time. Questions? Did I make my 10 minute mark? Okay. Great job. Okay. Any questions for Valerie before we move on to the anti-poverty piece of this? Cool. Thank you, Valerie. Um, okay. Well, I'm gonna pick up um, and uh, Leah Roslin and I are going to um, tag team here and I'll let her introduce herself to um, you all here in just a minute um, when um, we'll get to a slide that um, she's gonna cover. Um, but I'm going to introduce the, um, the anti-poverty uh, work groups plan um, to reduce poverty in Douglas County. Um, we completed this and got approval from our Human Services Coalition, which acts as our convening part, our convening stakeholder um, partner agency organization um, to develop this plan um, on January 27th. And um, in your packet, you got the full document of this. So I'm going to refer. That's the detail. You know, this is a high level um, walkthrough of this, but I am going to refer to elements of this as we go through here. And I know uh, Leah may as well. Um, and I hope any questions that you have, um, please raise them either through the presentation or towards the at the end. Um, but we're thrilled to be at this juncture where we can present this to each of you uh, to the commission and um, hopefully have a conversation about um, what's the role of Douglas County and how can we. Um, inspire part, those partnerships that you saw um, that were a part of developing this plan to help us be a part of, of um, taking it to the next level. Um, so real quick, this kind of gives you a sense of the anti-poverty plans progress and our next steps where we started um, and where we are today. Um, so uh, where we started, Valerie kind of gave you a background on that in the, um, the beginning of the 2018 CHIP process. and. Um, Sarah and Leah and other folks know this very well, but, um, you know, when you heard that this plan started out as being identified as an area, a plank of the community health plan of poverty and jobs and um, Leah and I through a series of conversations with um, health department leadership strongly advocated for the framework strictly to be focused on issues of poverty. Um, and continue to be focused um, with a lens of, of discrimination and um, the disparities that are um, the drivers of poverty um, being one of the key focus areas of us of, of our of our work um, and using the subject matter expertise and the wisdom of the human services coalition. Um, the human services coalition is a um, the next slide is a um, just a uh, the is, is a subset of the Human Services Coalition, but um, the Human Services Coalition just real quickly is a, it's just that, it's a coalition. It's a coalition of the willing. It's a coalition of um, that started out as the agencies that are funded by the county and the agencies that are funded by the United Way. And we got them all together um, in 2017, um, Leah and Sarah and I, and we started out just talking about um, emergency services funding. Um, so rent and utility assistance, who's got it, who doesn't, how, who's it serving, who doesn't it serve? And then trying to begin a conversation around um, collective impact. Is, are there better ways to serve clients? Are there better ways to stabilize 
um, families and individuals that are experiencing a crisis and need to stabilize their household. Um, what we heard after that first meeting was, it's great to get everybody together. We don't get to all meet and talk about what's going on in our different organizations and what's and also what's not going on, what issues aren't being covered. Um, and so that spiraled into um, it, what ended up being quarterly meetings that used to be at the Douglas County Fairground. Um, and then when COVID happened, we started meeting um, on a monthly basis. Um, but right before COVID started, we um, were able to um, finalize the plan that the Human Services Coalition would shepherd the development of the anti-poverty um, portion of the health plan. So we asked for volunteers within the Human Services Coalition to form the Anti-Poverty Coalition. And those are the agencies that are listed here today. Um, and there's some folks that have joined from these agencies. Um, I think Hugh Carter is on um, today. Um, as well, and he's just been instrumental in the development of this plan, as well as a host of other folks. Um, we couldn't have done it without them. And Leah and I really leaned on our roles as being the facilitators. Um, and it was, you know, it we have each of our organizations have a vested interest in this work, but we really tried to play a strong um, facilitator role with a ton of support from the health department. Um, Alex Kimball Williams. Vicki Colley Akers, Beth Llewellyn when she was there, Sarah Hartzig when she was there. We had so much help from the health department um, helping us. Uh, Josh Harson as well, I, I missed him. Um, they helped us collect best practices um, and, po best, and policy practices from around the country and helped us have just a series of really intentional, iterative conversations about the best ways to approach the issue of poverty. Um, Let's see, and I think this is where I'm going to hand it off to Leah to take a couple slides. And Jill, just as we're transitioning to Leah, would you prefer questions as we go or would you prefer questions at the end? Let's do it as we go. I just noticed on this particular slide, um, working with a number of our community college partners in my other role, we've tended to move away from the language of junior college towards focusing on community and technical colleges. Yeah. And so just being respectful of the really important work that our colleagues at two-year institutions do, totally. I would love it if we could update this language. Sure. And, and I'll let Leah talk a little bit about how, I mean, some of that language could have come directly from the survey work that we did. So I'm gonna let, um, but it's a very good point. Thank you for, and, and, and noted, and we'll, we'll update that, but um, I'm gonna pass it off to Leah to um, dive in here. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Can you hear me okay? I, okay, <laughs> I've been having ongoing challenges with Zoom. Uh, good evening, I'm Leah from the United Way of Douglas County. And uh, thank you, Jill and Valerie. So Jill and I are tag teaming. We tag team on a lot um, <laughs> and it's been great working so closely together throughout this process. So um, uh, yes, the, the slide that you see here is directly from the anti-poverty community survey that was conducted. Um, and these are ideas that our community members gave us um, in terms of what they would like to see um, for the most important priority initiative um, to reduce poverty in our county. Um, so I'm actually going to um, start out giving a little bit of context in terms of the community feedback and um, participation that we got that really did deeply inform um, what ended up in the plan. Um, so we not only looked at um, uh, the secondary data that has been compiled on um, the community website that the Lawrence Douglas County Health Department um, manages, and I hope that you all see, um, have taken a look at that, the My Sidewalk, that shows sort of what poverty looks like in our community. One of the most poignant um, um, statistics that we looked at from the beginning was that most people that are living at or below the federal poverty level in Douglas County are working full time. And so that really did inform my and Jill's 
push to move away from just looking at this as a simple problem of needing more jobs or even needing more job training or placement, um, even though that did rise to the top in the anti-poverty survey, to focusing more about what is going on that is driving the root issues of poverty in our community. Um, to learn more about what's going on, um, we did a lot of community engagement and also recognized that we want to continue to do more, um, that this is an area that although it is, um, was made a priority for us, that it's something we wanna keep going deeper in and to get more impacted community members involved and really um, lead, uh, um, uh, follow their lead in terms of priorities and, and what is being experienced in our community. Um, so the process that we used was um, we had a series of focus groups um, led by Christina Gentry at uh, Lawrence Douglas County Public Health. She facilitated a series of focus groups with community members living in poverty, um, living at the Lawrence Douglas County Housing Authority and um, other locations throughout the county um, that informed our initial sort of focus. And then as we were getting deeper into priority um, prioritization, she conducted additional focus groups um, with um, participants of Lawrence Family Promise, of, um, of um, uh, other uh, nonprofit community partner uh, participants. And then we also conducted a community survey, which was um, led by Rua Hasabala, who was then at KU and now is also at Lawrence Douglas County Public Health. Um, and we were really, oh gosh, I'm sorry. We were really um, pleased by the response that we got of over a thousand community members um, uh, responded to the survey and um, a much greater diversity of community members that are typically represented in these types of community surveys. So the largest demographic that responded identified as Latinx, Hispanic, or Latino. Um, most respondents identified as female, as caregivers. Mo the majority of respondents, highest level of education was high school. Um, and um, most respondents fell below the area median income. And so we felt pretty happy that we heard from folks that we wanted to hear from. And so um, we got some great information back from the surveys. Um, this, um, this was, um, um, it, in terms of the top ideas to address poverty, as you saw, they wanted free job training, um, it, um, recommended banning the box, so not asking about um, criminal backgrounds on employer applications, and were interested in no interest loans to the community members. Okay, Jill, I'm ready. <laughs> and then um, we also asked for write-in ideas. So what were your ideas that we didn't think of? Um, just tell us what you need as a community. And so we asked a couple of um, questions regarding that. One, what changes would you like to see in our community to help people living without enough money to meet their needs? And the responses were affordable housing, healthcare for everybody, affordable childcare with flexible hours and mental health support. And then the most important strategies um, that community members saw for improving wages was again, affordable housing, recognizing that the, that the wages in our community do not um, cover the high cost of housing here. Um, increasing the minimum wage to a family sustaining uh, livable wage which we are preempted by state law in making local policy change. So we explored some other creative um, initiatives in regards to this. Incentives for businesses to provide a living wage and attracting businesses that offer um, more high paying jobs. And then we also got some really poignant quotes from community members. Um, I'm ready for the next slide, Jill. Um, that have stuck out to, me and I think a lot of members of our uh, group in terms of uh, informing our framework and strategies. So 
help people in the long term instead of a sh instead of short term. Offering a night to stay in a shelter is not a long term plan. This will not reduce poverty. Um, some other poignant quotes were. Um, uh, Douglas County does a good job of caring about people, but COVID has taught us all that we cannot live in a society where people do not make a living wage and have benefits, or if help is not available if they lose down and fall their jobs. So essentially speaking of living wages and a safety net. And then um, one community member said this solution to poverty is super straightforward. That's not the harder complex part. The hard part is letting go of our internal values that reinforce the reality in which poverty is viewed as a natural outcome and an individual failing. That part is the real barrier. Um, so we used these quotes and priorities from community members to inform our strategies that ultimately ended up in the plan, which we're going to cover now. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to go over the first part and then kick it back over to Jill, I believe, right? Or are you covering them? Yes. <laughs> so um, in terms of the overall plan, our goal statement is to foster an equitable Douglas County economy by implementing systems-based solutions with an objective of creating policy system and environmental changes that result in an environment in which the percentage of BIPOC children living in poverty does not increase. Now we recognize that this is not, um, it, it's not a vision and an incredibly inspiring objective right now. We would much rather have seen objective around reducing poverty for BIPOC families with young children. Um, but we chose this uh, specific objective around not increasing for a couple reasons. One, because our plan only goes for two years before it'll be updated in 2023. And reducing poverty on a community level is not something that can happen in two years um, in any substantial way. Um, and two, we are in the middle of a pandemic and a great recession in which poverty is already increasing. Poverty has already increased for BIPOC families with children that we're prioritizing in this plan. And so um, even though it's not particularly inspiring as a goal, um, it's um, a, realistic, um, <laughs> a realistic goal that we're, we're hoping to move towards just not seeing poverty deepen. Um, and you can see here our priority populations. Um, I do want to mention that although um, this first iteration of the plan really is prioritizing Black, Indigenous, people of color um, with children under 18, as well as single parent female headed households and justice involved or formerly incarcerated residents, we recognize that there are other um, intersectional identities that also serve to drive deep poverty. So the intersection of race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, um, citizenship status, all of those things are something that we want to look at in the next iteration of the plan. And one of the real barriers for us over, time and time again became a lack of local community data. Um, and the fact that we just don't really know much about how different community members are really being impacted by poverty in our community. And so that barrier informed our first overall strategy. Um, our second one, sorry, <laughs> so our first one, uh, we have two developmental objectives, which means that um, it's something that we're going to be looking at and building towards over the next couple years so we'll have more detailed strategies after um, in, in, the, in the next plan. So the first one is in terms of transportation, that this is a barrier um, and driver of poverty in all the different focus areas of uh, you know, families with children in terms of getting to school and other educational opportunities, getting to employment, getting to court, um, uh, and um, the fact that um, as Joe will talk about um, when, in terms of the intersection of criminalization of poverty, um, 
community members are often penalized by having their primary mode of transportation taken away, um, which you'll get into. So you can see the strategy there. This is a developmental objective to um, increase uh, transportation for community members. Um, the second one is in regards to developing a data dashboard, um, looking at those intersections of poverty um, with disaggregated data on race, ethnicity, income, and other outcomes. Um, so that moving into the next iteration of the plan, we really have, we will really have much deeper um, and wide um, information about how poverty is impacting different groups that we can use as baseline measurement. And we've already started working on um, collecting more primary and secondary data through um, an updated um, community um, equity um, assessment. And I believe that Jill is taking it right from here. Thanks, Leah. Um, okay, so our first focus area um, is uh, children in child care. Um, when we when we first got the the anti poverty um, coalition together, you know, we coalesced our focuses our focus areas around um, children in child care, decriminalization of poverty, and jobs. Um, those were the key areas that it was determined to focus on. So um, you can see here that our convener in this work was Rich Mender with Success by Six Coalition, um, who um, worked with um, folks from um, uh, Child Care Aware, um, Bright Start. Um, I know the chamber was involved in that. They had a good coalition of folks that were together, that got together and um, put together the um, the strategies and the objectives that are before you. Um, but you'll see that in, in this first overarching objective um, on child care workforce development, that we're getting very explicit in terms of increasing the percentage of child care workforce who are BIPOC by 10%. Um, but we're, you know, being very intentional about growing the the amount of child, the child care workforce that's BIPOC, so that they're the so that the children, BIPOC children are served by folks in their own community. Um, and the, so we're cultivating both, both, in, both ends of that spectrum. Um, we're gonna provide, um, look at um, increasing the number of owned and managed childcare facilities and in ho including homes and centers. And we're gonna increase the percentage of childcare workforce who are BIPOC and are paid a living wage by 10%. Um, there's a lot of detail in this area um, in the, um, the larger document, but I just kind of want to hit the, um, uh, the, the highlights of this here. And I think, you know, if you look at this next slide and the strategies, this first one, um, launch a minimum viable concept, a pilot project, so to speak, of to provide high quality and affordable early care and education um, for BIPOC children and families, um, zero to kindergarten. And, um, there's a lot of opportunities here. And I think there's, there's conversations that are coalescing around, you know, what's possible and how could we um, develop a, a pilot project with some energies um, and some assets that are available in Douglas County today. Um, and that's something that I'm excited about moving forward with um, that, but, and having it identified in this plan is a pivotal part in getting it to the next level. Um, but just how are we supporting and expanding, you know, the business and instructional leadership and coaching for BIPOC early care and education programs, um, developing the coordinated early care and, co and education system to maximize child care industry, um, just having access to resources and being able to have um, efficient operations. Um, look at things like micro loan programs to help those BIPOC owned child care providers grow um, as small business owners. Um, look at things like wage supplements for BIPOC early childhood providers um, and advocate for things like tech refundable tax credits for early childhood educators um, if you tie them to some quality measures. Um, and then look at BIPOC providers in Douglas County who are enrolled in um, increase, excuse me, that are um, enrolled in DCF subsidies. Um, this is this strategy um, is one that actually has recently gotten the attention of DCF. Um, because they're so supportive of seeing us making this an intentional recommendation of theirs. They want to see more of their more providers signed up to receive those subsidies as well. Um, so again, you know, it's, it's just elevating these as key to advancing a larger strategy. 
Um, just, the next, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, I guess all of these strategies, I, I think that there are a number of reasons to increase the number of BIPOC childcare providers. And I think that's a really important focus for our community. I also struggle because we know that a number of childcare providers don't make a living wage. And so when we talk about this from a poverty standpoint, when we're talking about, I get, I get a little kind of concerned if we're trying to push this as a career area for BIPOC folks when we know that it's a low income career area right now. And it's often where we see folks who are living in poverty. And so I, I appreciate the focus on also increasing the living wage of folks who are doing this work, but I do really struggle seeing that focus on increasing providers from particular identities without a recognition that we may also be kind of contributing to income disparities. Absolutely. I'm sure that the group has had conversations about that, but I, I do just, well, and it just, it's its all the more reason why we've got to diversify our, our partners and our stakeholders um, and, uh, and and make the and make, make connections um, with how does this relate to a larger community strategy and, 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 and our economic development strategies and policies? Um, how does that tie to that? Those, I mean, that's the kind of thinking I think that we're hoping this will galvanize efforts around. Um, well, we do tend to see career areas that are dominated by women, particularly women of color, are some of our lowest paid career areas. And so if we're trying to, I know we're not mentioning BIPOC women identified folks, but typically this is who we see in these positions. So I, I would just be really concerned with how do we balance that focus on increasing the living wage while also focusing on diversity and who benefits in those spaces. Yeah, I appreciate that comment. Thank you. Um, uh, let's see. So our, uh, our next uh, overarching objective is related to the, the cost burden of care. Um, so we talk about by 2023, trying to increase the percentage of BIPOC families with infants and toddlers that are paying to pay less than 7% of their income for quality child care from where from 10%. Um, and then by 2023, increase the percentage of Douglas County employers offering paid parental leave by 10%. Um, this is a big one. Um, and this is something that, you know, when we first started talking, um, this is one, one, one suggestion that came out um, in our very early conversations in the Human Services Coalition. And it, and it, it came from Rich and it came from others. Um, so it's not new. Other communities are looking at or have implemented these strategies, um, but um, it's it's a it's an important one that I think us as an employer have to think about as well. Um, a little bit more on the strategies: um, establish a campaign to increase the number of qualifying BIPOC families that are enrolled in access, accessing the DCF child care subsidies. Um, and, and this is this is a strategy just because we're not we don't see enough families taking advantage of it, and we want to make sure that we're encouraging that to the greatest extent possible. Uh, create a community fund to fill those tuition gaps um, for folks when they're waiting for that DCF subsidy, in, and increase the community infant toddler child care financial aid funds for BIPOC families, uh, and create public private partnerships to income replacement fund for BIPOC birthing or adopting families and then launch a cross-sector paid leave policy initiative. Um, these are big, big strategies, um, but we feel like we, we have opportunities to move on them. The next area, this is a more simplified, this is a one slide um, is, uh, that, that I'm gonna cover as well is related to the decriminalization of poverty. Um, and a lot, there's a lot of detail um, in the larger plan document that you have, but um, I'm really proud of this part of the plan. Uh, Hugh Carter and I were the conveners of this um, work and we had a really great um, subgroup that helped us develop these. And I really um, tried to lean back and um, just really be a facilitator because I think it goes without saying that, oops, our organization, um, 
plays a large role in this in this goal and the systems that influence it. So um, you can see what our, our objective, um, reduce the incarceration of Black and American Indian Alaska Native residents. And that's directly attributed to the work that we've done um, through Criminal Justice Coordinating Council and um, you know, the path that we've um, been down as an organization these last few years. So um, it's, it's very personally gratifying to me to have this vehicle. Um, and I think, I, I do believe it's gratifying to the folks that um, were a part of this work that um, that really sits at the top of what we're trying to do. Um, but our strategies, starting with the first one, um, and this first one, I do think, you know, it's when, you, when Leah talked about that developmental goal related to data, um, this first strategy to establish uniform criminal justice reporting resource for law enforcement contacts, bookings, charging, and dispositions by race and other demographic indicators. Um, we definitely have a head start on that. Um, Mike Brower and Matt and Dr. Matt Cravens have been working on this um, with a lot of support from our new DA and a new sheriff. So I really think we have a really strong um, uh, foundation um, um, for this particular strategy. But I do think, you know, if you look at the details of this plan, we need more partner. We need more help from our um, our other agent, our law enforcement, criminal justice agencies. To if we're not collecting that data today, you need to. We need to start collecting it um, because folks in the community want to see it, um, and so we can measure our success. We can um, just promote transparency and get a better level of understanding about what's going on in our community and what's going on in the different systems. Um, so. A lot of details in there, and you can see in that in, in the in the detail of that focus area, there are um, we've identified a lot of opportunities for the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council to be a part of that. And um, I've been um, in communication with Mike Brower um, on just understanding um, just how we can go about doing that in a um, collaborative way. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, the next one is uh, review and reform fines, fees, and driver's license revocations. Um, there's opportunities here, and again, you know, if you look at the larger plan, we identify um, who's responsible or where we think we can start from um, getting some actionable movement on them. Um, there's there's opportunities here to um, have a lot of conversation. I think starting with um, where we have discretionary authority around fines and fees. Um, I think area of driver's license revocation, um, it, it is gonna take a lot of focus on um, what happens at the, what's, what's available to us at the state level. Um, and we're working closely with our, uh, with little government relations to make sure that we're advocating for change and we're monitoring that change um, from a state perspective. But um, we want to have a very defined conversation um, with the various stakeholders around reforming fines and fees. Because they're a huge driver of folks that are that are involved in the criminal justice system. Um, and uh, it's a huge opportunity for us. The last strategy is expand holistic low, low to no cost community resource navigation for BIPOC um, individ, individuals and families with client centered with a focus on advocacy and engagement of multi sector organizations, utilizing interdisciplinary models of legal and non legal services to meet client needs. Um, I think what what we really had some great discussions around this particular one, um, this particular strategy and a lot of energy here um, in terms of how do we go about creating these kind of resources? Um, are, and, and how do we um, uh, lift up resources like this that are already operating in this community that need to have um, some, some sprinkles put on them to help them grow and incubate a little bit more? A couple of examples of that um, that we highlighted at a recent Human Services Coalition are the Indigenous Center. Um, that Frida Gipp um, has been developing um, on the side, um, in addition to her uh, full-time duties at Haskell Indian Nations. Um, how do we support organizations or groups like that that want to do this, just this sort of thing? We looked at the Sunrise Project, the work that they're doing. We also looked at um, what are other community, what have other communities done um, in terms of providing cultural multi-purpose resource centers that um, Dr. Ferris Muhammad with the city of um, Lawrence helped us um, better understand how he'd been involved in models like that um, in 
uh, city of Dubuque before coming to Lawrence. Um, and, and I wanted to um, highlight that, um, you know, after seeing the presentation from the Kansas Holistic Defenders um, presentation at the most recent CJCC, I was really excited to see that. Um, and I think that that's the kind of model that we need to look closer at. So I really appreciate that, you know, Commissioner Portillo, you, you, brought, you brought that forward to be looked at. Um, I will say there's a lot of strong feelings in the folks that were engaged in our work that whatever is developed, that it be led by the folks that are going to be, the development of it um, needs to be led by the folks that um, are, are directly experiencing these issues. The communities that um, will be served need to be directly involved in the development of the work. So um, another group that's been engaged in um, our decriminalization of poverty work is um, Sisters in Charge. Um, and I know that they've, they're another opportunity um, that if we were able to give, um, provide some additional opportunities for them to incubate and grow um, as an organization, um, I think we could see a lot of synergies. Any questions on this one before I pass it off to our last focus area? Cool, go for it, Leah. So the last focus areas in terms of jobs. Um, and we have um, three, um, three focus areas related to that. So um, reduce barriers to employment for BIPOC residents um, with the objectives of decreasing the percentage of BIPOC individuals experiencing discrimination in employment in Douglas County and increasing the number of targeted job training programs and investments for BIPOC community members. Um, go ahead, Jill. So um, in terms of the strategies, you'll see related to um, the objective of decreasing the percentage of BIPOC individuals experiencing discrimination, a strategy related to that is just establishing a baseline measure for community experiences of discrimination and employment this again was something that we just did not have a lot of or much of any community data on. Um, one of the, one of the um, barriers in us even understanding what types of uh, discrimination and employment are being experienced is that we don't have any countywide system for collecting that information. So the city of Lawrence has a human relations division, which has been, um, um, which has seen a reduction in funding over the years. And um, in conversation with, um, with those folks, um, they noted that the number of complaints that have been made um, have paralleled the reduction of funding available. They don't have funds for marketing. There's not a great deal of community awareness that there's even a human relations division in which community members can report experiences of potential discrimination. And again, that's only for city of Lawrence residents. There is no comparable office for folks in Eudora, Baldwin, Lecompton, and unincorporated townships in our county. And so um, this is something that I'm, uh, I'm really hoping <laughs> that um, this commission might consider what, uh, as a count on a county level, can we do to provide support, not only for folks that are living in the city of Lawrence, but for other people in our county so that when experiences of discrimination happen, um, there's a place um, that they can have that uh, looked into. Um, and so really that's where we're starting is just understanding what experiences look like um, in terms of racial discrimination and employment. Um, secondly is creating and incentivizing an employment participation and a fair chance business pledge. Um, essentially um, uh, businesses committing to um, non-discriminatory hiring practices, including those with um, criminal justice prior involvement. Um, based on the evidence that we looked at and some unintended consequences related to ban the box, um, we decided not to include that as a strategy, but to provide this as a workaround. Um, so, um, so that um, businesses have incentives for 
um, not discriminating based on race, ethnicity, or um, or prior um, convictions. Um, and then it, um, increasing affordable and accessible job training opportunities for BIPOC community members. Um, and, and in tandem with that um, it is the accessibility piece. And the work group talked a lot about, yes, we recognize that there are job training opportunities available in our community, but that those aren't um, necessarily affordable and that there's, um, uh, there's a, a common sense that they are not accessible. They're not accessible in terms of the hours. Um, they're not accessible in terms of families with young children are experiencing barriers in childcare in order to attend, uh, uh, obtain that education. And then it's not accessible in terms of the framework being used by um, a lot of the current job training programs. So we're not talking about sort of just increasing marketing to place or recruit more BIPOC community members into existing job training programs, but to really think about, um, about it from a different lens and entering from um, um, a more holistic um, and equity-driven um, perspective and creating future job training programs that really prioritize BIPOC community members. Um, and then some other strategies are in terms of um, increasing communication between service providers and the business community. So um, fostering those networks, um, which is uh, you know how a lot of people get jobs is through those social networks and um, and contacts and the social capital. capital. Um, also improving job retention by fostering greater diverse, equitable and inclusive work environments by providing um, education to local businesses um, so that um, folks in those jobs are not experiencing trauma and discrimination um, in the workplace. And then um, developing low or no interest personal loan programs um, for community members. And then the second um, priority focus area is around increasing um, entrepreneurship among our BIPOC community members, um, increasing the number of BIPOC owned businesses in Douglas County um, by um, increasing um, BIPOC representation among leadership in the Douglas County entrepreneur ecosystem. Um, and again, not, um, looking holistically at that from um, an equity driven perspective, um, increasing affordable and accessible opportunities for training and support specifically for BIPOC entrepreneurs that are designed and led for and by BIPOC entrepreneurs. And then again, um, giving money to folks. <laughs> um, this goes back to the quote that sticks out to me um, in terms of our mental models of reducing poverty. Well, one, one sure way to reduce poverty is to give people money. Um, and so we were looking, really looking for ways that we could give folks more money, knowing that capital, um, financial capital is a barrier and who can even start a business in the first place. Um, so that is um, the high level overview of the plan. Um, here's a website with information um, with a link to sign up for the committees if there's interest um, among any individuals in getting more highly involved in the work and implementing the strategies. And then, like Jill and I said um, from the beginning, this is a two year plan and we're already looking <laughs> ahead to okay, what updates need to be made? How can we improve the process moving forward? to include more um, of our prioritized community um, and what strategies we might want to see moving forward and would love um, your involvement in this work. This is Commissioner Portillo. I really appreciate the overall presentation. And I just wanted to circle back to that last priority area around entrepreneurship, really. It's when we talk about Funding, when we talk about low income loans, one of the big reasons that we need that is the racial wealth gap. And you all have talked a lot about kind of our, our lack of data in our community. And so I'm wondering if 
there is any sort of plan to collect data around the racial wealth gap. We know that there we have some data around home ownership versus renting. And I saw in some of the in that full report, kind of the cost that is associated with renting in our community. And I imagine that we have pretty big racial differences in who owns and who rents in our community. And a big part of that contributes to the racial wealth gap. And when we think about capital for starting companies and capital for having this kind of entrepreneurial spirit that is often really focused on who has the kind of funding that can start that. So is there a plan to collect data around the racial wealth gap and kind of opportunities for capital and investing in entrepreneurial activities? We had, um, I think our strongest opportunity to start collecting that data, we actually talked about, um, a, a group of us talked about um, earlier today as a follow-up to a presentation that um, the Douglas County E community hosted um, in um, January. Uh, it was a presentation from a group called Forward Cities about how to create an um, equitable entrepreneurial environments. And one of the way, one of the starting points, of course, is how do you assess your existing environment? Um, and so what we talked about, the, the, the organization that um, did the presentation with us was um, called Forward Cities. They have a strong um, partnership with the Kauffman Foundation um, and have developed um, some local partnerships through entrepreneurship communities um, in um, Kansas City, Missouri um, on along the Central Avenue corridor in KCK and along the Truce corridor in KCMO. And so the, the, the starting point that they pointed us towards was, um, well, first of all, they affirmed that, you know, this is a, that this is a real thing. Um, it, it's happening in communities all over the country, but how you, how do you begin to address it and is first doing that assessment work. Um, so they've developed what um, it's a, it's called a, um, a score, uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem, um, scorecard um, that um, I'm happy to share as a follow-up today, but um, our plan is to um, develop a campaign um, to get as many um, uh, as many folks in the community to take that survey to assess the ecosystem um, to see where we are today and where we and then understand where we start. Um, Forward Cities has done this kind of work in communities all over the country. And then there's that subject matter expertise of the work that they've done um, to date in um, KCK and in KCMO that we feel like we can leverage um, through our relationship that we have with Network Kansas, which also, which is the kind of the parent organization of um, our e-communities loan program. The loan, the e-communities loan program for a long time, you know, we've been struggling with um, how do we get more folks to access these funds and they're matching loan funds but they require a private bank loan and for the individuals also to have their own matching capital in that as well. Um, that's a tall hill to climb just to get to the starting point. Um, so where we go from here, um, again, is just assessing and then understanding where we're at and where we go from here. So that's my strongest hunch. Um, and I'm working with the Lawrence Chamber, Ryan Rains, um, who manages the Lawrence E-Community Program um, to figure out how we can move that forward the most expeditious as possible. And I did, you know, listening to the BTP, BTBC presentation last week, those are things that are thinking of, I'm thinking about as well as, you know, how do we create on-ramps um, for folks to be, for more folks, a more equitable access to um, those kind of jobs that I think are related to this work as well that I wanted to elevate that, um, you know, I really was excited to hear that conversation from the commission last week and um, again was really excited from a timing perspective to get this plan in front of you. Just if I could jump in another possible kind of, um, you know, um, opportunity for these things to merge together is and I'm sure, you know, Jill from your conversations with the uh, the Lawrence Chamber and Ryan Rains, um, you know, they're working very closely with the city of Lawrence on their economic development strategic plan. And so, you know, this is a great time for that whole uh, work is formalized and firmed up. Can we get pieces of this jobs plank in front of them to see where there could be some, um, I hate to use the word synergy because it's just so overused, but it is seems to be very apropos in this situation. Is there some synergy between these two uh, 
plans and, and how they could support each other. Absolutely. And they, um, so Britt was involved in the jobs work group. And um, so we have been looking at each other and have been discussing ways that we can integrate and um, collaborate to, um, yeah, to add capacity to both. Um, yeah. And absolutely, there's to be done, Sarah. Absolutely. This is Commissioner Kelly. I just have a couple of questions. Um, first, I want to say thanks to Leah and Jill and Hugh and, and Valerie for the presentation. And I think especially Jill and Leah and Hugh, so much work. I remember coming to early Human Service Coalition um, at the fairgrounds and and to see the progress that's been made is really exceptional. Um, I got to sit in um, when the plan was approved by the Human Services Coalition, and, and there was quite a bit of discussion about those not being included in the plan. And, and I think there was, there was a fair concern raised um, after our BTBC com conversation about that and I appreciate that and, and community members drawing our attention to it. How are you responding to that, those concerns that are raised at the Human Services Coalition um, around those with disabilities? I think the, you know, our, our, our commitment at this point, you know, Leah, Leah talked earlier about, um, you know, recognize, um, recognizing the intersectionalities that is um, within our focus group, our focus area. Um, I think that we realize that um, there's no question in our minds that um, it, it's an area that we obviously need to cultivate and we need to be a little more intentional about um, organizing the folks that are engaged in that work in the community. And I think you're gonna see that um, at some future human services coalition to try to get some greater understanding of the issues and the challenges. Um, and I do think that um, in the next iteration of this plan to redouble our efforts to try to uh, capture um, strategies that are reflective of the comments that were there. I will say that, you know, I, 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 I feel very good about where we did focus our efforts um, and being very explicit in our focus, our focus on BIPOC, it was intentional. And, that, and, our, and our hope is that by, we're, cert, that we're, lift, we're lifting all boats. If those strategies are successful, then we're, we're, we're elevating um, the, 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 improving the environment for folks that have um, disabilities as well. Um, I think our hope is just in the next in the next version of this plan that we can have another go at it and engage the right partners in that work. And to tuck on to that, um, so at the April Human Services Coalition meeting, we will be having presentations from Arkansas and more about what the barriers are being experienced um, at that intersection of disability and poverty and other intersections. Um, and um, it, it's also being at, um, in the updated community equity um, being done. So um, right now um, that assessment focuses really on race and ethnicity, um, but we're working with the health department um, and KU to expand that to learn more so what are the experiences and experiences of discrimination and barriers being experienced by people living with disabilities in our community or LGBTQ community members or other groups that honestly, we haven't even started asking questions about as a community. It's frustrating um, that you know, we don't have that baseline data already, but, but that's where we're starting is trying to grow that common understanding while at the same time provide education on sort of how to hold intersectionality. Um, because I have realized that 
seems to often get stuck in an either or. We're either talking about, about BIPOC community members or we're talking about uh, people with disabilities as if those aren't the same groups and as if those intersections aren't experiencing, in fact, the deepest poverty and the deepest areas of discrimination in our community. And so I think we really need to just cultivate our ability to hold that complexity and intersectionality. And um, I think if we do it well, then uh, there's going to be a much improved um, version of this in 2023 that really does hold those complexities. Lee, I really appreciate how you said that. I mean, I think Alex Kimball Williams was at one of our meetings and said we shouldn't have the struggle Olympics here, you know, and who who's going to be on the top of the podium of having the hardest time that that's really, I think we need to recognize that there are lots of populations out there that need um, support and an intentional focus. So I, I really appreciate how you said that. So thank you very much. And I think you sort of referenced my second question. So if I'm I just, I, I want to, I guess, make sure I'm confirming this is that, you know, some of the strategies that are referenced that we don't have baseline data, followed by a strategy that we're going to move forward with this. And it's sort of like, well, wait a minute, don't we need the data first? And I'm going to assume that, um, that the plan will change as that data is, is developed. And um, do, do you have, and I see your head shaking, so for anybody who's listening, um, so do you have an idea of when that timeline might happen? Because I'm really expecting that our human service partners will look at this plan and will be coming to us using this plan as a guide for where their efforts should be. Um, but when might that, is, is that part of Valerie's work moving forward or, yeah, those are my questions. I don't know if there's a question in there, but you get the sense, I hope. I'm going to say that that, that, that is something that we are looking to the health department to, to help us with. And, and Valerie's going to solve it all. I'm just kidding, just kidding. Actually, Patrick, you know, when I was reading through these, um, being that I'm just a little over maybe 70 days here. Um, I came up with exact questions. So how, why would you choose 10% change? And so what are you basing that on? And where did that start? And where would that data come from? So I, I'm right with you. And, um, and that will be necessary in order to know whether or not any of the strategies and actions engaged in do actually move the needle. So, yes. And I, I do want to just sort of comment about that, because I think one of the things that we've learned here at Douglas County with our work with behavioral health and criminal justice coordination is the data is the hardest part. Data is the hardest part. And, and it's not easy. And, and I think in some ways, this area has even more challenges than some of the, you know, we have some reporting mechanisms in, you know, inside hospitals and, and inside behavioral health, but not enough. And we have some inside criminal justice, but not enough. And so, I, you know, I think it's not high profile fun work, but talking about how we, and how we manage that is, is going to be really important moving forward. And so I, I always really appreciate this commission's dedication to that and understanding that it's not just snap your fingers fast and it's the kind of thing that appears. So, um, you know, I think we're going to need to bring the whole community along in that conversation about data. We really are. I, I think the other well, thing this is, is this is Commissioner Portillo. I also, I love all these conversations about data. I'm a social scientist. I want nothing more than better data about everything, every the time. And I think there are a number of strategies within this plan where we know there's a problem. So while really good data is going to show us how our strategies move our community, we also know that there's a problem no matter what. We know we have a child care problem. There's not enough of it. It's way too expensive. It's harming our communities in all kinds of ways. We know there's a racial wealth gap that affects the entire country and Douglas County is no exception. So there are lots of things where we need better data so we have a baseline and we know how effective our strategies are or are not. But there are also lots of things that you know there's a problem and we can start moving forward with some strategies and some solutions before we 
data because our data collection will never be perfect. And we have to move, be able to move forward with strategies while we're creating better data collection as well. I think there are things that can be done in parallel because there's a lot of time that comes with building partnerships and a shared vision of what needs to happen and who needs to be engaged and how that would look that could be going on at the very same time that you're collecting data. Um, but then you also need to be thoughtful about what's sustainable for that data so that you know you don't want to collect once and then you have no capacity to collect again to know whether you're effective, but also to look for those kinds of indicators in the community that perhaps are not exactly answering your question, but maybe are approximate as a way to, to start being able to have a feel for what the level of the issue is and how to see if it would change. This is Commissioner Reed here. Um, Thank you everybody for the presentation. Thanks um, Valerie and Leah for and Hugh for joining us this evening. Um, and Jill and Leah in my short time here, I have garnered that um, the two of you have done a lot of convening and facilitating um, and helpful hurting, if you will, of, of local agencies and a lot of players that typically are not always in communication with each other. Um, or have struggled to have somebody who really convenes that. So I'm just really, I'm grateful to the both of you for um, taking that part on and being persistent and making sure that as many people as possible are coming to the table for the conversation because that's really important and we need buy-in. Um, I don't know those questions are kind of sussed out with other commissioners' questions. I just wanted to... Um, I guess add a bit of comments to Commissioner Kelly's point and Leah, your response about um, thinking about and focusing on folks with disabilities. Um, and I just wanted to add that, you know, my experience in advocacy work and um, well, and honestly, my own personal experience growing up with um, a mom who had a lot of struggles, but never any diagnosed ones or clients have that have um, what I believe are very obvious um, disabilities and things that really impact their capacity to do a whole number of things, including work primarily, um, but that those things are not or medically affirmed in a way that rises to the level of getting disability, disability benefits. And so when we talk about disabilities and people with disabilities, there are a lot of folks who are living in our community that are experiencing and suffering um, some invisible um, impacts to their city to, to, to do a variety of don't have access to or have been disability benefits or other services that are reliant on having that kind of documentation. So um, I just wanted to raise that point and appreciate um, community members reaching out to commissioners since last week after that BTBC conversation, um, raising the point that we do have about that when inequity conversations. Um, and I, uh, I do appreciate your comments, Leah, about um, how we have to uh, not think about intersectional identities in a, within a binary way of thinking, that it's either or this or that, um, and that the whole point of thinking about things intersectionally is realizing that each individual has a whole host of experiences. Some of those are completely visible and impossible to um, hide. Anyway, and some of those are completely invisible and never seen unless they're um, asked about directly. So I just wanted to um, mention that and then otherwise reiterate my appreciation for all this work and that there's some, um, I'm particularly as a court advocate, particularly excited to see some progress on addressing fines and fees and driver's license revocation. And that um, is just a huge systemic issue. It's a complete domino effect in somebody's life um, to have those issues arise. And then there's no, there's no path out. Um, there's no path out unless somebody has money to give you for a path out. And so I'm just really excited to see that on there because it 
uh, impacts so many families. And it is sometimes the first domino that tips over, right? And just um, creates a huge impact. So I know that that is a big state level issue. I'm hopeful that local um, courts and local players um, will find creative ways to um, figure out how to minimize that impact on our community members and perhaps consider how do we provide um, access to resources and a path to getting licenses reinstated to getting back to a place of having mode of transportation not be a barrier. Um, so anyway, I'm just grateful for all the work that you all have done and excited to see where this goes. Um, I'm sure it'll feel like a blip of time and in two years you guys will be presenting a new um, five year plan with some enhanced goals. So, and I am grateful also, it feels like there's a, um, the feedback from community members, the general um, kind of I, air of this plan, I think is really about respecting the fact that we have, we have a responsibility to support folks in um, figuring out how to move away from just surviving and help people thrive. Um, and that that is the real work of community care is supporting folks in thriving and not just surviving one crisis to, to the next. This is Commissioner Portillo. I really appreciate the focus on an intersectional approach in a lot of this work. And I'm going to admit this is just where the professor in me comes out in a really big way. I think that we've all been using the term correctly in this space, um, but I get really worried when we use the term intersectionality because we often talk about it as identities and lived experiences. And really when we think about intersectionality, the way that Kimberly Crenshaw originally was theorizing about this concept, it's about intersecting forms of oppression and the ways in which our, our lived identity or the ways in which our identity may be made up of multiple intersecting forms of oppression. And I think that it's really important that we keep that systems of oppression focus when we use the term intersectionality. So we're not talking exclusively about identities, but we're really keeping a focus on those systems of oppression and the ways in which the intersections of those oppressions create really unique lived experiences for folks in our community. So I, I do just wanna say thank you all for using the term correctly and ensuring that as we move forward with this community work, we continue to take that systems approach. I would just share a comment. Um, you know, I, I think, and I really appreciate the way that we're looking at multiple organizations across the community, multiple partners being involved in this work. There is some new space for the county to be engaged here. Um, Jill will get a chuckle to see transportation and know that I love talking about countywide transportation and how that's impacting us all across. And so seeing that transportation being there is an exciting recognizing that that's part of the um it's a system right and that system is making it difficult for people um if we can't improve it so quick shout out to everybody to go and fill out the city's transportation bus system survey um but uh, you know and also child care that is not a space where the county has really operated before um, but if our responsibility is around public health, it's a place where we should be invested and engaged in. That doesn't mean that the city doesn't have a role in economic development. You know, certainly that's part of their work and, and they should be invested as well. And the school district should be invested as well because it's about readiness. Um, but these are new places for us. And I think it will, um, I'm going to hold the bar high for us, but also ask folks to join with us, join in arms and, and help us navigate this space in a new way. Um, Valerie, go ahead. You look like you have a comment. Oh, you're just waving at me? Okay. Um, so uh, I, I just, uh, uh, oh, she's leaving. Yeah, it's not about me. Um, so, uh, but I just really, I'm excited to see some of these things in the plan and, and look forward to hearing how the county, what our role will be in it going forward. 
So along that line into also comment, you know, based off some of the comments from Commissioner Reed, you know, and I, I think, um, well, Valerie's gone now, so I can talk about the chip. Um, but what I want to say is that, you know, and, and as a, an original kind of founding member of the steering committee, uh, when this, uh, for the first steering committee, uh, when it came together on the chip, I, I think it's fair to say that many of these planks had what I would call a head start. You know, um, you know, when you talk about behavioral health and housing and, and access to healthy foods and built infrastructure, those groups had a head start. This group did not have any such head start. Um, they took actually, I think, extremely raw, um, poorly articulated, I'm going to just say that, um, information and made a really powerful place in, in where there is not that, like as Commissioner Kelly said, where there is a lot of space here, where there are a lot of groups that we are not mo mobilized and motivated to make progress. We have it in pockets, but not consistently. And so I say that one, to acknowledge the contributions of this group and what they've been able to come up with so far, which is tremendous, but then also to make sure that we're patient and, and thoughtful and deliberative as we move forward, that there's a lot of work here and we're not going to solve this overnight, but the sheer fact that we've articulated is progress um, and, and that's a huge step forward. And I think that, you know, just always trying to make sure this group understands that we understand that this is new ground to tread, to plow. There's a, there's, there's a lot of things that were mentioned tonight that were bold and that we're a long ways away from. And so I, I, I'm excited to see that and I'm excited for the county to be a part of that vision. Um, and I also just, you know, hopefully we can do this at a pace that um, we can all sustain because it's, that's what's the most important is that it's something that's becomes institutional to our, organ, to our community. So. This is Commissioner Portillo. I know that we're not taking action on this item, but I assume that we will take public comment if we have any. So Sarah, is there anyone there in the courthouse with you for public comment? No. Jill, do we have anyone online for public comment? I don't know, Hugh, did you did you have anything that you wanted to add? I wanted to, and then anybody else that in the that wants to um, provide public comment, just use the raise your hand function. Sure. Thanks, Jill. And everybody, yeah, I just wanted to briefly say, first of all, it's been a great experience. Jill and Leah have been fantastic. I've learned a lot watching you herd cats and bring this whole thing together. So this has been great. Um, I'm also, I'm, I'm really proud and excited that the chamber, you know, we've, we've pivoted in recent years, but especially this past year, um, you know, the, the, the incidents of racial injustice that culminated in the, the, the murder of George Floyd was one that initially caused us to kind of reevaluate. And while we're not, we're no longer focusing on strictly your traditional uh, business issues of a chamber, but on the overall financial and well, financial health and well-being of this entire community. I think we're uniquely positioned to assist with a lot of these things, with our partners in the nonprofit sector, with our partners at the city, the county. Um, you know, groups like the Schools Foundation, United Way, et cetera. Um, we're in a good position to help. And I'm really excited uh, that the chamber has allowed me the time to focus for this last year, year and a half, feels like a little longer um, on getting this plan out. But now that we have the plan, that's where we're looking to engage and, and uh, you know, the chamber itself, more staff, but also our volunteer leadership and the business community. And I appreciate Patrick, your comments about from an economic development standpoint, uh, you know, early care and education is not something that typically the county's been in, typically the city, you know, in some capacities maybe, but, and, and Commissioner Portillo, your earlier comments, you know, around the, the challenges of pay and whatnot in that, uh, I will just say that, and around the idea that the goal here is not to have poverty increase as opposed to saying decrease poverty over the next couple of years, that goal is tougher than it sounds because early care and education, child care, the crisis was already happening. During this pandemic, it's exacerbated, but it's exacerbated for the lower income folks. The, the biggest solution that employers have been able to do is to allow for more flexible hours, working from home, for the but those are for higher paying jobs and the percentages are much higher for white people too. 
you know, black, BIPOC, Hispanic, et cetera, and low income jobs do not typically have the option of working at home. And so just holding steady is a huge goal for the next couple of years. And early care and education is going to be, I think it's one of those things that it, it, it touches on so many um, important things to the community, but economic development, number one. So I, I, I think you'll see the chamber certainly helping to convene and work in that area, in all three of these areas, but early care and education, I see a, a big focus moving forward and, and look forward to it. So thank you very much. This is Commissioner Portillo. Thank you, Hugh. Jill, did we see any hands for public comment? I'm not seeing any. Um, really grateful for Hugh to for sprinkling in those comments. Um, I, I'm so so grateful to him for investing in in his time in this work. Um, and um, we'd be remiss if we didn't give shout outs to folks like Anju Mishra with HCCI, Melissa Fisher Isaacs with um, the um, Lawrence Public Library was a strong convener um, in the work of the jobs group um, and is uh, stepping back to her traditional role at the library. But um, we had a lot of really great folks at the table and um, he was one of them. And I, we, it took a, a, a really passionate village of people to put this plan together that I wanna make sure that we're um, shout, out, shout out of gratitude to. And thank you to the commissioners tonight for letting us bring it to you. Um, and I hope you'll stay tuned for additional opportunities that um, we'd love to bring your way um, to try to take this plan to the next level. Um, one thing I didn't mention, I want to sprinkle in real quick is, you know, how we use the human services building, the Douglas County Human Services building. There's opportunities there. We talked about the multi-service center, uh, resource centers. Um, we've got groups that, that would use that space and could use that space. So we have actionable um, opportunities available to us today. And I, I hope to come back to you all in the future about that. And I hope you'll keep this plan front of mind as we move into the budget process this year as well. That was another important part of the timing perspective here. This is Commissioner Portillo. Thank you so much. This entire discussion was really productive and I appreciate it. With that, we will move on to appointments. Do we have any appointments to consider this evening? I don't believe we do. Okay. And so we will move on to miscellaneous items. Sarah, do you want to kick us off with miscellaneous? Thanks, commissioners. Uh, yes, you have a packet. Uh, your My memo in your packet includes our latest legislative update from Little Government Relations. Also, I had Jill add some information about the Kansas Emergency Rental Assistance Program and uh, how like some of the partnerships that we really helped create during our, our CARES Act funding might be able to continue to sustain to get additional funding as it's moving forward. These are the very early stages. I don't think we have exact numbers yet, but those partnerships are now in place and, and hopefully can begin can continue to receive funding that might come from the state level to assist in rental and utility assistance moving forward. Um, also included in the packet, I put a, I have a longer description from the health department and our equity impact advisors with Unified Command related specifically to how we um, at Unified Command and the equity impact advisors are distributing doses um, and the allocation of doses that have been set aside for, for to ensure, because we hope all our distribution is equitable, but to actually you know, try to ensure that we are getting some uh, equitable distribution of vaccine. That group's having, you know, great success with what they've started with. And I think that will definitely continue as we move through it. Um, I, I do want to mention, I think on the memo, that's the, the last of the memo items I wanted to mention. Uh, we don't meet next week, just to remind everyone, oh, but yeah, we don't meet next week. And after that, we've got a few work sessions coming up. You also have attached to that memo, and this will be new for, I think, some of the new commissioners. You see our, our CARES Act update as to how we have, how the expenditure of funds has gone in that. And, you know, just 
that's really tremendous. Um, you know, I think if anybody listened to our conversations last summer about how would we spend all of this money, well, I'm just really proud of that work. And you can see the accounting that um, our team has put together to talk about how we've distributed the funds to the community. So um, please take a look at how, uh, how successful that's been. Um, I do want to mention that we have, we, we had originally thought we would have the revisiting um, of the honeybee septic CUP on this agenda. And uh, I wanted to let the commission know that uh, the applicant has withdrawn their uh, application for CUP. Um, uh, and uh, so we don't need to put it back on. They withdrew it because they have received their certificate of occupancy for their other property and they'll be able to relocate and that there's no need for the CUP at that point. So just to tie up that loose end, in relationship to COVID-19 and um, our ongoing unified command planning, I do want to announce, I think commissioners probably have seen that we have officially launched the call center um, for, for uh, a, you know, a partnership from many of our partners inside Unified Command for the call center, but it's up and going. Please help spread the word. Um, and we will be working closely with that group just to make sure we're answering correct questions correctly and moving into that process. Um, I think that is the big news for the week there. Um, we are working, you know, very closely to continue phase two distributions of vaccine. And they had another uh, phase one clinic today. I heard it went pretty well. Um, and more second dose clinics, mass vaccination clinics on Friday. I do want to uh, just let commissioners know just because, you know, it is also severe weather week. And we had also activated um, our emergency support function four for fire um, earlier today in our emergency operations center related to grassland fires. I have been told that it was stood down, um, but it's a really windy spring and I do anticipate that we will continue to have some of those issues moving forward. So that's all I have for commissioners. Do you have anything for me? This is Commissioner Portillo. I just really appreciate that the CUP discussion was resolved and it sounds like everything will work out well for both the applicant and the neighborhoods that are affected by those two properties. So that that was a really fantastic update. Thank you. We should probably maybe just, uh, I don't have anything for you, Sarah. Well, I do. The CARES Act work, and Brooks Hour needs to be, I mean, to see that we of all that money, 98, was it 98.7 was spent? I mean, there was a real worry at one time that we would not be able to spend those, that we couldn't get that money out the door and that our partners couldn't spend it fast enough. And that's just fantastic to see. I know that was a ton of work on the back end. Um, and I'm sure it's not really over yet. Um, and I hear more money may be coming and that just frightens me. I mean, it's good for the community, but the administrative work of it frightens me. <laughs> so I, I um, so, but I just want to say thanks to, to your staff and to Brooke, especially because I know she works so hard on that. Thank you, Commissioner. And yeah, you, you know, um, it's probably one of the largest single projects executed in the smallest amount of time that I have done in my entire career as a local government professional. And it would not have happened without Brooke. Um, and her efforts and, um, but it is, it, 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 and we did not pick an easy route, um, classic Douglas County. So, um, it, you know, it, but it, it was a huge endeavor and I'm very pleased with how we've ended up. Well, and that, that sort of stems my question as we hear more possibilities of more dollars coming specifically to cities and counties. Um, you know, I don't expect an answer on this tonight, but it's something I want us to be thoughtful of right out of the gate. You know, can we learn from what we did last time? And is there a way that we can uh, use the phrase flat footed? I don't want to be flat footed on this one. I want to be ready to jump and, and think about that. You know, there's a lot to learn in the summary that you provided, especially around utility assistance and that we maybe if we had to look for a place where boy I, I think we can set a higher goal for ourselves utility assistance might be it um, because that seemed to be across the board however we were doing it wasn't working um, it wasn't getting to the people who needed it um, and we've heard that from the city so um, I, you know just as we think about that and move forward 
Yeah, I know Brooke is watching the legislation to see how it comes forward. You know, just what I do know at this point is it would be a different distribution model before we received our funding from the state and we're working with them. This would be different um, if it comes more directly, although that could change. You know, there's just a lot here that's not decided. So, um, you know, I think we are we're trying to stay up on how it would come forward and what that would look like as it comes down. So um, I appreciate that. Um, and we'll do the best we can to stay on top of it. We might also wanna share with the public that we had a great planning commission retreat with the city um, on Friday. Um, I appreciate all the planning commissioners, those are volunteers <laughs> putting in that time on that um, and um, just really appreciated the conversation um, and then uh, also, I think we referenced our, our district judges meeting, quarterly meeting, and, and that was um, for Commissioners Portillo and Reed, that was a, a wonderfully robust conversation with those judges. I was super excited about it. Um, you know, I must be an elected official if I get super excited about luncheons with judges. So, um, <laughs> uh, but I just really, really appreciated it. Commissioner Reed here. Um, <clears throat> I I don't have any questions for you, sir. I just want to be extra excited here about the um, the helpline being up and running in the call center. And I know that that was a quite frankly a, a quick turnaround from you know deciding that yes, this is an absolute need, and how do we do it to being live today? So thank you to everybody that put work into that and. Um, I'm really hopeful that especially as we see more vaccine come into the community and we move into phase three soon, um, what, that this will be an opportunity to really um, make sure folks feel informed and like they know exactly where to go for information. So grateful that's running. And Sarah, can you share the partners? There's, I mean, that is a community, to pull that call center off was, was the purpose in my mind of unified command, everyone coming together and saying, hey, here's how we can help, here's how we can, can you just give us a little more background on the call center? Well, and I may miss some folks. So, um, you know, I would say that, you know, and, and sometimes experimentation has been part of what we've learned through this uh, process of working together through Unified Command in response to the pandemic. You know, lots of phones were ringing off the hook. Um, and, you know, and then as we entered phase two, the Senior Resource Center stepped in to help answer questions related to seniors over 65. They had previously not been a part of this effort, but because of their role in the community, they were a natural touch point for seniors um, as we entered phase two. So when we began talk, seeing how what the volume of like with, of questions in phase two, which was dramatically different than phase one, I mean, it, phase one was mostly healthcare. It, those folks were aligned um, with what they needed to get. When we opened it up, it became much more complex. Um, so you know, I have to thank the University of Kansas and their um, stepping up with their existing structure for a helpline. And we were able to add on to that capacity to add, include our partners at LMH Health, um, the Lawrence Douglas County Health Department, uh, Senior Resource Center. Um, am, I, am I forgetting anyone else? Carrie may know because she helped with the press release that has also contributed uh, time and staff to the resource center as we've stood it up. I can tell you that Robert Benecki from our team, of course, has said it's been a lot of time working with Andrew Foster at KU to get this up and running. Um, and we really hope this will just, you know, be a great clearing point for folks as we continue to move through the system and we can learn from it. You know, the questions that are coming from that, how do we improve our communication? How do we, how do we make sure they have the right info moving forward? And, um, you know, and, and then how can we improve from here? So, you know, as, as we've said, you know, we've, um, I, we do believe phase three is coming soon. Um, and, and as more vaccine comes into this community, it's, it's, we're, this kind of communication is going to be key to making sure that we all stay on top of what's happening. So. Thank you, Sarah. We don't have any other 
questions, thoughts, or big ideas, I think it may be time for us to adjourn. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't offer big ideas to this. <laughs> we could be here for a while. I think that this is already the longest um, mm -hmm. meeting of Commissioner Reed and I's tenure. So <laughs> we've gone through quite a few big ideas this evening. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Well, you can enjoy your weekend. You can enjoy your next week off and we will do our best to try to keep the 17th um, manageable as well. So we appreciate everything that you brought to, or at least I appreciate everything that you brought to us today. It was all really great conversation. So Lots thank you all to keep chewing on. Yes. And um, looking forward to seeing everyone in two weeks. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.